How many of you ate at McDonald's or Subway last month? Cannot see hands, but okay, it's pretty dark. And how many of you have eaten at McDonald's or Subway outside of the US? Well, pretty healthy crowd. I'm not gonna judge, but <laughs> there are tourists and there are travelers. The tourists are afraid of the unknown, the different. You see them eating at the McDonald's or Subway that's right next to the local food market. Tourists usually don't explore the world. At best, they go on long commutes. Nothing wrong with that, but I consider myself a traveler. I adapt to local customs, eat what the locals eat, enjoy trying new things, embrace feeling uncomfortable, and have a blast getting lost. See, traveling to me is like building a puzzle without a reference image. I have been to 61 countries so far, and nothing fits my soul like deciphering maps, memorizing impossible names, and freezing time with my camera. Now let me ask you a tougher question. If you had only one year left to leave, what would you do? And what wouldn't you do? I don't know how long I'll leave, but this question always inspires me and scares me. As we all know, the older we get, the harder it is to forsake the familiar and comfortable. I also believe that our biggest regrets are not our actions, but our inactions, the things we wanted to do but didn't. In addition to this, I randomly came across with three seemingly unrelated concepts that, when put together, made me understand a beautiful quote by Pico Iyer. Sometimes, making a comfortable living and having a good life move in opposite directions. The three concepts are autotelic, an activity or creative work that has an end or purpose in itself, ikigai, the happiness of always being busy, and this beautiful quote by Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar, craft is what we are expected to know, art is the unexpected use of our craft. With all of this in mind, I spent six years trying to convince my wife to quit everything and spend some time living like we only had a year left. Giving your material life away to travel extensively is certainly a tough decision for anyone. But some of you probably know a few Americans or Europeans who have done it before. The stakes are a bit higher for a Colombian architect who moved to the US in the late 90s to fulfill his dream of becoming a photographer. Then, many years later, moved to New York to become a filmmaker, won an Emmy, and then had to convince his wife to quit her job as an architect in Manhattan and donate all of her shoes. <laughs> so, about 18 months ago, we sold our car, donated 90% of our belongings, that's a 9-0, closed our beautiful rent control Brooklyn apartment, and embarked upon a journey around the world, hoping to accomplish three simple goals. Spend more quality time together, recharge our creative souls, and for myself, improve my craft as a storyteller. We have lived in 20 countries, walked in almost 200 cities, and slept in more than 100 different beds. On the road, we learned the gap 
between knowing and doing. For example, most of my friends in New York love wine. They can tell you everything about the best Bordeaux vintages and the subtle differences between the French and American oak. But not a single one has actually made wine. While photographing wine harvest in Italy, Spain, and Portugal, I asked Don Francisco, so what do you grow here? And he said, grapes. Yes, I know. But is that Castelao or Trincadeira? And he replied, I don't know. Surprised, I insisted. So you have been making wine for 45 years, and you don't know the name of your grapes? Nope, he said. I just know how to make good wine. Don Francisco also taught me that quem trabalha por gosto não cansa, who enjoys work doesn't get tired. That's a good one. Traveling is a great way to test the strength of your relationships. Some of my best memories were my wife's worst nightmares, like that week in Bali, living in the middle of a rice field surrounded by nothing but silence and nature. Now, if you ask her, we were only surrounded by giant spiders, millions of ants, and flying cockroaches. <laughs> Traveling also allows us to confront our own belief systems and learn about tolerance and humbleness. In Myanmar, we spent two weeks with Tura, the happiest person I have ever met. Tura volunteers full-time at a monastery that doubles as an orphanage. He barely makes enough money to cover his living expenses, and yet donates half of his salary. For my birthday, my wife and I provided lunch for the 150 children at the temple. Seeing the children's faces while eating chicken soup made me feel blessed and incredibly upset with myself for not doing similar things more often. I'm still upset. While circling the globe for a year and a half, we noticed four interesting cultural trends. The first trend is that online content is pointing toward more offline local experiences. Soon, I believe, the most successful brands will be those that can bridge online and offline, delivering seamless experiences throughout the consumer journey and getting better not only at reach, but relevance. The second trend is how people increasingly care about where their food comes from. In an age of industrialized food, more than ever, people crave local, organic, and sustainable farm goods. A third trend is a growing preference for handmade goods over those that are mass produced. And I'm not talking just about shoes or furniture, but the range extends from bread to experiences. When there is a human story or a familiar face linked to a product, we're more likely to make a connection. The fourth trend is a rebirth of local pride in local cultures and in preserving traditions. This is amazing in a world where conglomerates and monopolies seem to own everything and get bigger by the week. We notice this wonderful local pride in Portugal, España, Italia, Morocco, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Mexico, and Colombia. Younger generations still look to the US as the trendsetter when it comes to pop music or urban fashion. But there is a coolness factor in increasingly lo using local ingredients, materials, ideas, and sounds. When it comes to technology, and especially mobile payments, the world's attention is quickly shifting to the east. 
But that's a whole other topic for another day or another TED talk. <laughs> I shot hundreds of hours of footage, thousands of images, and recorded lots of soundscapes. As our journey ended, my challenge as a visual storyteller was how to use this content and the many lessons learned. Assisted by a team that includes composers in Brooklyn and Morocco, video editors in Charlotte and Lisbon, a writer in Chicago, and a motion graphics artist in Hong Kong, we are developing a, an immersive, interactive project called Visual Serendipity. By showing the sights, sounds, and energy of a place, we're building a platform where the viewer becomes part of the story. The project aims to show the many similarities we all share with others and hopefully increase tolerance amongst different cultures. Here's a trailer for visual serendipity. Uh. People always want to know if we achieved our original goals. So let's see. Spend more quality time together. We actually spent 24 seven for 551 days, usually in tiny places, and we're still together. So let's consider this goal achieved. Recharge our creative goals, our, our creative souls, absolutely. We saw wonderful landscapes and buildings and had amazing experiences. But our best memories are of the people we met and the many stories and meals we shared with them. Improve my craft as a storyteller. I do feel that today I can parachute anywhere in the world and come out with some decent images and a good story. People also want to know what the key lessons are after such an amazing journey. And there are many, but to finish, I would like to share four. First, as Peter Drucker said, life is a paradox. 
in order to build one must tear down. Or paraphrasing the modern day explorer Ben Saunders, real inspiration and growth only comes from adversity and challenges and jumping out into the unknown. Second, we learned firsthand about meliorism. Regardless of what you see in the news every day, I can assure you that most people around the world are good and generous by nature. Humans can and do work together to improve our world. We all gain when we feel proud of who we are and what we can become. The third lesson might seem obvious. Even though technology offers us customized news and entertainment, and we can talk to anyone in the world essentially for free, people seem less happy and more disconnected. I do love technology, use it every day, but as we become more distracted, we might be missing the time to live our lives fully and in the present. And here's the final and most important lesson, at least for me. Real wealth is discretionary time. And the universal currency isn't dollars, euros, or bitcoins, but smiles. Thank you. <laughs>